We've all heard of pacemakers for the heart, but pacemakers for the stomach? Well, today we talked to Andrew Pullen from the University of Auckland about the new research in this area. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for talking to us today. Now, Hi. look, um, why would you need a pacemaker for your stomach? I mean, I didn't even know there was electrical activity going on down there. No, that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting question, and I guess when I first got into this, I didn't have a clue either. I spent a lot of time working on building mathematical models of the heart, um, and I remember being approached by a group that said, we want, you, we want to, you to help us understand the stomach and how the stomach works. And I thought, how hard could that be? You know, it's just the stomach, <laughs> right? Heart exactly. has electrical activity, electrical waves goes through, contracts the muscle, pumps blood around the body. You know, what does the stomach do, right? It actually does <laughs> pretty much the same sorts of things, but in a more complicated fashion. So what people don't realise is that your stomach, my stomach right now, has electrical activity going through it. Very slow, about three times per minute. But there's this electrical wave going through the stomach all the time. Now in the heart, we have it about, I don't know, once a second. And every electrical wave causes this big contraction. You know, pump blood around. In your stomach, you've got this electrical wave going through. It may not do anything. It's the, heart, the stomach just sits there. If you eat food, if you are feeling stressed or some other things, then it may invoke another re response. So if you've got food, your stomach stretches, this electrical wave goes through there, oh, something's different's got to happen there. I've got to contract, and it undergoes some massive big contractions, much larger, much more violent than the heart, because it's trying to smash up this food and break it up before it starts entering the intestine. So I've actually seen videos of, the, of real stomachs as it does, the, and, and it's amazing, it just looks like, the, the stomach contents <laughs> smashing against the end, your, your bottom of the stomach's closed, and every now and then after it's smashed the ray, the food a bit, part of the intestine or the, the, the little valve at the bottom open up, a little, little squirt goes in the intestine, <laughs> and it's smash, 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 a little bit more in there, smash, 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 um, greatly speed it up, of course. Yes. And then over you know a period of two, three, four hours, your stomach and the normal person will be empty from the meal, and all that will be in the intestine, moving down, getting absorbed, getting further broken up, etc. So this is actually, more, as you say, more complicated Absolutely, than the because you've got this electrical wave that doesn't always initiate a large contraction, but when it needs to, like when you've eaten food and it stretches, a large contraction occurs. So it's always in a way it's more intermittent, isn't it? I mean, the heart is just, it's the one thing going Well, electrical going is on. not intermittent, I, I understand. Yep. Possibly when you sleep late at night, maybe it's not there, I'm not sure. Yep. But all the time, for you and me right now, there's this electrical impulse going through our stomachs. But it has to, but it has to respond. So if you were eating all the time, it would have to go, oh, good Lord. Here we go uh, again. Yeah, you, you'd be, you'd be <coughs> really stressing your stomach a bit because it would be contracting all the time. Mm. So your stomach undergoes these large contractions and what I've been talking about is normal, healthy behaviour. And in a normal, healthy heart, you know, you've got the electrical wave, the heart contracts, no one ever has a pacemaker. People get pacemakers in the heart when the, the rhythm is breaking down or they need help because uh, they need a little extra impulse to generate that contraction or they need some way of stimulating the muscle to contract. Same sort of thing is being talked about in the stomach. There are some people whose electrical rhythms are all over the place. So these patients uh, don't die like you would if you had a heart attack, but they get very malnourished. Uh, they vomit a lot, they feel sick a lot. They'll eat some food and, and it'll come up the wrong way. Their electrical waves are going the wrong way, contractions are all going the wrong way. So we're not talking about supermodels here as such. We're no, 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 no. With talking a real about, condition. <laughs> we're talking about real, real people. <laughs> That's right, real conditions. And these people can eat, they feel sick, they feel full um, when they haven't eaten too much and the food just doesn't really get into their body. So people have started to think about how we could possibly restore the electrical rhythm. And it's still very, very experimental putting an electrical, essentially a modified heart pacemaker into the stomach and trying to control the electrical rhythm to regenerate uh, normal stomach activity. So, so I guess the first thing you'd have to have done is, is, is work out exactly how the normal stomach works and before that, you can... And, and people don't understand normal. <laughs> At a crude level, they understand normal. At a very detailed level, they do not understand normal. And that's, that's where I've that's a lot of what I've been doing for the last few years, is trying to actually understand what normal, the normal behavior in the human stomach is. So we've developed new electrodes, we've developed uh, new experimental uh, protocols, and we've actually gone in and put electrodes directly on people's stomachs 
I, they're undergoing surgery typically oh, right. for something else. Mm -hmm. So at Auckland Hospital, we've had people who have been undergoing, for instance, possibly liver uh, surgeries or some other type of surgeries. We've been given a small window of access. Mm -hmm. uh, the patients have approved this and we've placed electrodes on their stomach and actually recorded their normal electrical activity. We've also got a group in the US that has approached us and they are a group that actually put these stimulators into patients who are very sick. It's a sort of last, last res resort for these people and we've managed to go over there, take all our gear and actually record electrical activity directly from these sick patients' stomachs and we're very busy analysing those data right now, but what we see is quite different behaviour. The electrical rhythms behave differently, they go different directions, uh, we've got a much better understanding of normal activity now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's about three electrical waves at one time going down the normal stomach. They start in a region higher voltage, faster, then they move around the whole circumference of the stomach and kind of get organised as they go down the stomach and they're a bit slower and lower in amplitude and then they kind of speed up again at the bottom. So we've got a fairly good understanding of normal behaviour now. So are these, um, in America, were these actual sort of stomach pacemakers prototypes that were popped into people at last resort yep. that you were looking at? So they've actually been so, tried, so a, we, a version of them. So absolutely. So what we were doing was recording electrical activity from these patients both before they got their stimulator implanted mm -hmm. and after they put the stimulator in. Uh, they call, we call them stimulators. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit why. <laughs> yeah. um, and then when they turn it on and they, they, they set it with different settings and we've been collecting data that's that are for these different settings and seeing how the stomach responds. It's still early days yet mm -hmm. as we go through literally mountains and mountains of data, uh, but we are starting to get some idea about what might be a good setting or what might not be a good setting for these stimulators. So some of these stimulators are actually working? Are they benefiting the patients? Patients outcome appear to improve. The patients, not all of them, um, I mean some of them uh, a very sad story, one of the patients that we actually w worked with a year or so ago is, is no longer alive. They were so sick, so this is really a last resort. Some of them actually end up with their stomachs removed, uh, most of their stomachs removed because that, that doesn't work. But some of the patients appear to uh, really respond to this and uh, manage to lead, uh, in, whereas they might be vomiting ten times a day, now they're vomiting one or two times a day. So what they call their symptom scores improve. Yeah. Um, what sort of conditions are we talking about? Well, it's typically gastroparesis. Um, so that's the broad name for it. So yeah. uh, gastroparesis is, is weak stomach. Uh, literally, I think that's what it means. Yes. Uh, but it's it's condition given or name given to someone who has problems actually emptying food from their stomach. So oh, okay. these <coughs> people would eat food, and after about four hours, uh, still a significant proportion of the food still remains in their stomach, and. That can't be a good thing. That is not a good thing. Um, so these, that gets, uh, that's the name given to these people, gastroparetics. And there is, if you're diabetic, um, diabetic, there's a class of people that have diabetic gastroparesis. So mm -hmm. s diabetics can end up developing this that sort problem of condition. with your stomach. And then no, no one's done stomach transplants, have they? That's not something that happens. I have, don't believe a stomach transplant is possible. Mm -hmm. um, they can, you can get away with uh, very small parts of your stomach, so in obesity surgery for instance, they can cut out a lot of your stomach and you end up with a very, very small pouch. Yes. Um, the stomach is really just the first processing part of your gastrointestinal system, well your mouth is, it's the second processing part, yes. and it breaks down food, then goes in your intestine, it down and there. it's the intestine where everything gets absorbed. Having a small stomach there, you, you just can't eat too much and you maybe can't eat things that have got to be broken down a lot but all the absorption can still go on as long as you get through that part of your, of your gastrointestinal tract, okay. So what sort of mathematics would you use to do this modeling that you need to do? So we, so good question. What we're doing is then, we have built mathematical models of, of stomachs. So uh, these look like stomachs and we replicate the electrical waves that go through those. Mm. Um, and we use all the data that we're collecting to calibrate, if you like, our model. So within our model, we have descriptions of just about every single cell within the stomach. Um, and there are 
different ions within the cell, and these ions move across different the cell membrane and, and move out or in, depending on what the ion is, and that causes the change in voltage there for the electrical wave that you see. So we have Incredible. equations that describe how each of these ions moves over time, and then we've got equations that describe how all these cells kind of connect together and how current will flow from one cell to another, and we connect that all up into one big gigantic you know, enormous model uh, with you know literally you mega know, equation 50 million unknowns that we solve and then simulate uh, yeah. normal electrical activity and what this allows us to do if this model is working very well is to go on there and interfere with it so do something different so for instance the question is what is going wrong in these diabetic gastroparesic patients one thing we do know is that they've suffered a certain type of cell loss so in your stomach there's a certain type of cell that is known to be responsible for this electrical wave, it's mm -hmm. getting it up and helping it go. And, and it is also known that in these diabetic gastroparesis patients, they have a loss of these type of cells. They're not all gone, but they've lost some of them. And so the question is how, much can you, how many of these cells can you lose and still get normal electrical activity? Uh, or if you don't have many of these cells, can you still get normal electrical activity? And so in our model, we can go in there and start depleting these cells. We can throw one away and it won't make any difference. You know, we've got literally millions of these things. But you start throwing a few away, a few more than that, then we will at some point start to see a breakdown. If we've got none of those cells, there's no electrical activity. So the, one of the questions that we're trying to investigate is, is where, you know, where is that sensitivity? Where is that cutoff for these cells being uh, degraded? How many of these type of cells do you have to lose? Or, and, and is it the same everywhere? I mean, is it more important to have these cell networks in place and everywhere, or can you get away with it in certain places? Because understanding that also allows us to understand where might, how might you restore this electrical wave? What sort of current you've got to get uh, deliver? Uh, what sort of impulse you've got to deliver? Where you might want to deliver that current? How you deliver that current? to try and mimic what was there but we've now lost in terms of the cell network. So how would you, so to measure um, electrical activity in, in a normal stomach, you literally have to put electrodes on there to find out. Absolutely, look, I've got some here. So if you were taking someone in, oh, that, what's These this? are them. These are the electrodes. Oh, these are, so these are measuring these, these Yeah, well, no, well, these are uh, special flexible electrodes that we've developed here. And what yeah. you probably can't see is on the end of that, there's actually 32 electrodes. So each one of those cool. dots are linked. We connect this to a plug, and, and, and that gets sent off to our special recording hardware. Yeah. These get sterilized. The plugs get sterilized. Yep. Um, you know, so they're all in sterile bags, and then they get unwrapped in surgery. They all get collected together. I've got a few of them here. So um, different sorts. but. We can put them together and keep the same spacing. So we can make, we can tessellate these into a variety of patterns. Yeah. Um, and we can record from up to 256 electrodes at one time. So that's wow. um, eight of these. But it has to be directly on the stump. You oh, can't so, on the tongue. No, 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 no. So the, the voltage is too small to really get cut, reliable cut contact. The so skin, yeah. when, we're, when, the, when we've got an open abdomen procedure, we've yeah. all got these pieced together, taped at the back. We just place them directly on the stomach, put a bit of damp gauze, and yep. then it's hands off. And look what we see. We see electrical waves. And we just wait for a while because yes. we need to record a certain amount of activity. So at Auckland Hospital here, we have a 15-minute window total from go to woe. Yep. So we'll get five to eight, five to eight, five to ten minutes recording. By yes. the time these get placed on the stomach, wet gauze, we wait. Okay, we've got our recordings. Thank you. Remove. They carry on through the surgery. Over it. The US, where we've been working with these open abdomen patients, the, the surgeries are several hours long. These electrodes get left in place uh, for quite a while. Yeah, they put the stimulator in. Uh, in part of the protocol, when they put the stimulator in, they have to adjust it to test how it's responding. We get to record all, all that time. information. So we get hours, literally hours of recordings. Um, and at 256 electrodes, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we have a huge amount of data. And the, the stimulator itself is just a, a small device that it's would go... It's about the same size as a, uh, a normal cardiac pacemaker, so it just yep. gets slipped underneath. With its own battery pack, it's got its own it's source of power. It's all got its own battery pack, yeah. And, and that will slip on, on the outside of the, the tummy? Uh, or, so what they do, right they, 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 they create a little pouch just under your... You know, they cut you open, they create a little pouch just under, you know, inside there and, and yep. slip it under. And it's got a couple of wires that it connects to the stomach. 
uh, and then it just stimulates the... And they can uh, calibrate it on the side? Uh, on, on they can thing. control it. Uh, they, they have a Remotely? Special, uh, they have a special controller that I think they can adjust it telemetry-wise, yep. and then they can set a, a few different settings and basically control the frequency, uh, control the type of waveform, control the current that's delivered. Wow. There is a trade-off between how much energy you're allowed to deliver and how long the battery's going to last. Yes, that's the other um, thing, is you yeah. have to always have to look at changes. And so the stimulators this group is working with are very, very fast stimulation. So whereas I told you normal electrical activity of the stomach is about three times per minute, mm. these stimulation, the stimulation protocols they're doing are hundreds of hertz, thousands of hertz maybe. So they're stimulating much farther than normal electrical activity and the, the theory is maybe they're stimulating uh, nerve responses somewhere else. So, oh, okay. so unlike the heart, where you know what stimulation frequency you want because you want to replicate a heartbeat, in the stomach you could be stimulating it slow, three times a minute, or you can go up to maybe 10,000 times a second and still try and elicit some response, and no one really knows what the best thing to do is. Right, so this is sort of the new, new area, new territory Absolutely. that you're looking at. And refining. Has yep. any of it done, been done here in New Zealand? It's all the stimulator, I'm not sure whether you can get a stimulating implant done in New Zealand. These are experimental devices. They're, yep. um, you, can, you can only implant a certain number. It's restricted by you know, uh, law about how many, you, I think you're not even allowed to build and, and, and store them. You've got, to, you've got to say, hey, I've got so many patients, therefore you build for patients. So yes. Because it's still undergoing experimental trials. Our part in this is to try and understand, improve understanding of normal activity and the abnormal activity. And I believe that, that out of that will flow better ideas about how to both design the stimulator uh, and where to put the electrodes of the stimulator and, and what you should be doing to control the stomach. Would it have any other applications for, uh, for obesity, Absolutely. For so a another strange thing, in the heart, you always want to do the same thing. You want to generate a heartbeat. Yeah. Okay. Obesity complicated disease, but s your stomach empties, obese people, their stomachs, a lot of them empty very fast, faster than you and I. So we would eat, oh geez, I'm still full. And yeah. They're hungry again, right? Yeah, because yeah. food's gone. So you might think that, why well, want to slow this down? So their electrical waves or their contractions are too strong or it, it's going too fast. So why don't I try and stop or disrupt the normal electrical activity? So rather, and so the electrical waves go down the stomach, like mm -hmm. trying to squeeze a tube of toothpaste. But if I say, well, let's stimulate from the bottom up and let's get another electrical wave in there to interfere with the normal one, maybe I slow down the stomach. And there's been yeah. a very, very small trial done on patients where it indicated that maybe this might have some, some value to, to what they're doing. So they've done a small trial on, on some animals and then a small trial on people over in the US and says, hey, th this, this might have some benefit. We have managed to replicate this in our computer models and we have certainly managed to disrupt yes. uh, normal electrical activity. In fact, we've managed to completely have it overtaken and get the electrical waves going completely the wrong direction. And if you've got the electrical waves going the wrong direction, there's no way your mechanical, your, your contractions are going down. So and I mean, it's still the same concept as something like stomach stapling because the idea is to make you feel like you're still full. That's exactly right. Or, you know, or not hungry, as it were. So <coughs> stomach stapling, you can think of, you know, that's quite a... That's a one-way thing. You know, I'm yeah. going to rip out and, and, and I'm going to end up with a small party stomach. Yeah. Um, this, yes, it's it's invasive in a sense, but maybe there are ways to put this in without having to open you up. Maybe there's other ways to, to put these in. People get pacemakers in the heart quite routinely. Maybe there's uh, a simpler way than what's been done at the moment to put them in. And you might be able to just turn it on when I eat a meal. Hey, well, this I'm, is I'm right. feeling hungry, let me, let me just throw a switch, I'm gonna have a meal now, and let's keep it on for an hour or two, so keep the meal in my stomach longer, uh, slow down the food there, and, and maybe I don't feel hungry quite so quickly. Exactly, look, in, 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 10, 15 years time, we have some nano, nanotechnology, it might even be in the food. You just <laughs> eat it there, or I'll eat some, yeah. Interestingly <laughs> though, you know, I could, well, not me, but the people that do this, you know, if I stuck a stimulator down on your butt, it's it, you know in the right place and, and did and messed around with that it would slop your stomach, you know because it's all connected. So if there's a blockage somewhere down there or something <laughs> interfering, it's known that you know it, it it's it, that can also interfere with the normal activity well, well, of the stomach. So it's all connected somehow, but we don't yet know how. All probably. I can say is I don't want to be one of your undergraduates. <laughs> anyway, look, thanks no, not for me. Very much for talking. <laughs> no <today>. worries. <laughs>